All right. So we left off last time uh, addressing the question, how are bacteria and archaea similar structurally while being different chemically? And we introduced um, a couple of areas where uh, we got into the taxonomy, and I just I showed you those figures and told you that that was something you're going to need to figure out a way uh, for you to get comfortable with that understanding. And, and, and I, I thought it would be important to let you know what, it, what the assessment on that material is going to look like. So the way it's going to look is um, you'll have something like a matching question, and you'll be given a specific form and be asked to match it to the correct taxon taxonomic group to which it belongs. Okay, And so that's, that's what I expect for you to be able to handle assessment-wise. The reason why that's important is so that you can understand a little bit about that organism because of what group it's in, right? So you'll be assessed to be able to match the example to the correct taxonomic group, but the value of that comes in understanding a little bit about it based on how it's organized. So to, to finish up this question of how are bacteria and archaea similar structurally and different chemically, I wanted to note something that uh, I mentioned um, or something actually that one of those figures mentioned in the taxonomy. It mentions a group of bacteria called gram-positive bacteria. And they are separated as a, as a unique taxon, a unique group uh, or, or a collection of bacterial species. And so I wanted you to see what that looks like chemically. And again, this isn't comparing bacteria with archaea, but rather organizing bacteria uh, based on some, some differences. Now, it does illustrate the cell wall. And so here's a gram-positive bacterium. Here's a gram-negative bacterium. And the cell wall in bacteria is made up of peptidoglycan. Uh, in archaea, the cell walls are not made up of peptidoglycan. They are almost always there. Almost all species of archaeans have cell walls, as far as we can tell. Uh, but they are not made up of peptidoglycan. And so gram-negative bacteria, what you, or gram-positive rather, what you see, uh, and, and that is it under a microscope, or if you stain, the outermost part of this bacterium is that cell wall. And so gram-positive bacteria, uh, basically they're called gram-positive because a stain or a dye that embeds into the cell wall is visible in those bacteria. They take on that stain. Gram-negative bacteria are called gram-negative because they do not take on that stain because there's an additional membrane outside of their cell wall. There's something blocking that stain from getting to their cell wall so they don't pick it up. And so there's some very big differences between these groups. Uh, a lot of our uh, antibiotics work by either uh, attacking the cell wall or preventing the bacteria from assembling cell walls, meaning they can't replicate. Because if they can't make the cell wall, they can't make new bacterial individuals. Gram-negative bacteria don't respond to those in the same way because their cell wall is a much... Um, much less important structure for gram-negative bacteria. It's much thinner, uh, and it is not the barrier by which they interact with their environment through. They have an additional membrane that is different. Uh, it's still a lipid bilayer like the inner membrane, but it does have some chemical differences, and that is what you actually see and what you interact with uh, with gram-negative bacteria. <laughs> so there are some medically important gram-positive bacteria but the overwhelming majority of medically important bacteria are gram-negative. Okay? And so it's important to understand a little bit about the chemical differences and, and what are we talking about when we say gram-positive, gram-negative. Again, gram-negative, the outermost structure is the cell wall. Really big, really massive cell wall, ton of peptidoglycan. Gram-negative bacteria, really thin cell wall, a lot less peptidoglycan, and then a membrane outside of that. All right. Any questions? Cool. All right. So the next question: How does an under or how does understanding the metabolism of bacteria help us find them? And and really this this deals with a, a bigger question of how does understanding the metabolism of anything really help us to predict uh, where they're going to live and how they're going to function? Because that's really what we're getting at is is understanding the metabolism of bacteria, understanding 
you know, what they break down, what they eat, how they use those materials. Understanding that information is going to help us make a lot of predictions about how these bacteria live and therefore predict where we're going to find them. So like all living organisms, bacteria metabolize nutrients. Even those that are photosynthetic, that derive most of their energy from sunlight, they still metabolize nutrients. They still chemically break down some materials and then build some of their cellular components with those materials. Sunlight doesn't provide everything, it just provides the energy. And so here's some what, what you would call macronutrients, and, and by macro we're not talking about, the, this, this is a really disappointing term, because you see macronutrients and you're like, oh, really large nutrients, because macro means large. But in this context, macronutrients means really abundant nutrients, not necessarily large. And so uh, the, uh, what is it, six, the six most important uh, macronutrients, and this is actually in order of importance because it's in order of the percentage of the mass made up by this particular element. It's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. We talked about one of the characteristics of life is being carbon-based, right? And so the, the overwhelming majority of the mass of our cellular components is actually made up of, of, of carbon. Um, now, hydrogen and oxygen are obviously going to be really abundant because of their role in molecules and also in water. Uh, nitrogen plays a really large role in a number of biomolecules, phosphorus and sulfur as well. And then these are not the only macronutrients. These just happen to be the six most important. Bless you. And so another really important macronutrient is iron. Um, and you might think of iron as far as red blood cells, and that's important for us, but bacteria don't have red blood cells, uh, so they don't need iron for that reason. But they need iron to actually metabolize other materials. Uh, iron uh, plays an integral role in um, unlocking the energy in a biomolecule and actually storing it as ATP, the energy currency of the cell. Okay, and so iron plays an integral role in that, but suffice it to say right now, iron is another important macronutrient, and the role it plays is helping bacteria metabolize other materials. So we can organize bacteria uh, based on, on how they uh, obtain energy and where they get their carbon. And sometimes it's more important to think of where do they get their carbon uh, than where do they get their energy. Okay, both of which are important and both of which help us to actually define the metabolism of bacteria and make predictions of, of where we're going to find them. So carbon makes up about 50% of the composition of the cell. And then so we've got some various categories. We have what are called chemoautotrophs or chemoautotrophs. Uh, and by the way, there are no eukaryotic chemoautotrophs. It is, it, it, this is this kind of a metabolism or metabolic uh, practice is only found in prokaryotic cells, bacteria and archaea. Um, you oftentimes find these near, near hydrothermal vents, and we talked about this last time, and, and a lot of these making a really big uh, biofilm, okay, a really big uh, mass, uh, microbial mass, or a microbial mat. Um, now, because of how ubiquitous this term means, uh, incredibly present, okay, and another way of, of thinking about this is kind of a cosmopolitan distribution, meaning found everywhere, but ubiquitous, I think, is a better term because prokaryotes, not only are they found everywhere globally, but they're found literally inside of all other living organisms, and so you kind of have this idea of prokaryotes being everywhere, uh, but because of how ubiquitous, how ever-present uh, these bacteria are, and very metabolic strategies, uh, these, these organisms play a huge role in cycling nutrients throughout ecosystems. And so this is, is, is maybe a byproduct. So the answer to this question of how does understanding the metabolism of bacteria help us find them is it allows you to make predictions about where they're going to live based on how they get their energy, where they get their carbon, uh, but then a, an outcome of that is it allows us to make predictions of what role they're actually going to serve in the ecosystem, which again can further help us 
make predictions about where to find them. Okay, so here is a table out of your text. Uh, I don't like it. I don't like it at all, not because it doesn't contain good information, but I think it's structured really poorly. And I feel like a lot of the tables in the text are like this. You know, it's nice if your tables are, are really well organized, but I feel like they're, they're not. Because energy sources stops here, but there's no bar separating it from carbon sources. You're just supposed to intuitively know that. Uh, and then you've got uh, energy sources under chemicals, and then you get into separating it out this way. It, it's just, it's kind of hard to follow. So this one is one out of another text. You have access to these slides. Uh, and I think this one is organized better. It contains all the same information, but it's just, it's, it's organized better. And so here you've got your energy source, um, either light uh, or oxidation of molecules. And that doesn't just need to be uh, organic molecules, although oftentimes it is. And then your carbon source, whether it comes from organic molecules or it comes from carbon dioxide, okay? If you're getting your carbon source from organic molecules, you are eating other living things, okay? Or you're eating dissolved organic material in the water, but that organic material came from other living things. So you're still indirectly eating other living things. Okay, so we call these organisms heterotrophs because they are not basically making their own organic material. They are getting their carbon for that uh, from other organic molecules. Autotrophs get their carbon from carbon dioxide, basically pull it out of the air or out of the water and synthesize their own organic molecules. And then energy sources could either be light, which we would call photo, or um, by oxidizing, that is pulling electrons out of other materials. Uh, and we would call those uh, chemo. So you've got chemo autotrophs, photo autotrophs, chemo heterotrophs, photo heterotrophs. Uh, these two, are only found in prokaryotes. So chemoautotrophs and photoheterotrophs are only found in prokaryotes. These other two are found in prokaryotes and in uh, eukaryotes, all right? So this is just, uh, I, I think, a good way of organizing the metabolism of these organisms and a, a good way of helping you realize that even though there's a, a large variety of different strategies that these individuals employ, we can still categorize them into discrete categories, which helps. It helps you to make predictions about what they're going to do and how they're going to live. Because if an organism gets its carbon source from carbon dioxide, you don't have to think too much about that, how that plays a role in terms of recycling nutrients, because it's basically <coughs> creating the nutrients. These are the producers. Okay, They're not playing an active role in recycling some of those. All right. So here, uh, right out of the text, it shows you a couple of the cycles, and I just want you to see the role that prokaryotes play in here. So the carbon cycle, um, a big role that prokaryotes play in here is actually helping to unlock the carbon that's trapped in dead organisms. So like we get our carbon source does not come directly from carbon dioxide, right? We are not autotrophs. We are heterotrophs. We eat other organisms. So our carbon source is organic molecules, okay? But when we die, all of our carbon is basically locked up and needs to be released in order for it to continue to move through ecosystems. And a lot of prokaryotes play that role through decomposition, recycling some of that carbon uh, out of organisms and allowing it to re-enter uh, into the cycle. Also, another big role that prokaryotes play uh, is as photosynthesizers as autotrophs, meaning they get their carbon source from carbon dioxide directly, and they're either pulling it out of the air or pulling it out of the water and making uh, organic molecules for the first time, and then they can be eaten by other organisms, okay? So bacteria play a, a role at both ends of that. By making organic molecules for the first time from carbon dioxide or in helping to recycle some of those organic molecules, those carbon-containing forms, and allowing carbon to keep moving. Does it make sense? Okay, cool. And then in the nitrogen cycle, basically every step in here requires bacteria. Nitrogen does not move without bacteria. Carbon moves without bacteria. Bacteria just help to keep it moving. Uh, nitrogen does not move without bacteria. You've got basically atmospheric nitrogen, and the only way that becomes accessible to other organ organisms is by bacteria converting gaseous nitrogen 
uh, into ammonium. And then by converting ammonium into other compounds that living organisms can use. So nitrogen does not move at all without bacteria. Okay. And so when we start thinking about the role bacteria play uh, in ecosystems, and maybe you're asked a question, what role or how do bacteriophages impact humans, which forces you to kind of think about, well, how do bacteriophages impact bacteria, and then what, what, how do we rely on bacteria? You need a ton of nitrogen to build your body. Okay? You cannot build bodies the way we know bodies. That's animals, plants, fungus, anything without nitrogen. And you don't access that nitrogen without bacteria. So life doesn't work without bacteria. That's what I'm getting at. Okay. That's the summary. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we're going to do a bit of a lecture break. Right now it's going to be a shorter lecture break because we don't have as much time today because of our quiz. And I know the quiz was my idea. I'm not blaming you for it. Um, and so <clears throat> what I want you to do, you're going to go right into discussing it with those around you. You're not going to start off uh, thinking through it. We're going to pick back up our discussion that we had last time about an alternative way of thinking through that the earliest fossil forms are prokaryotes, right? And so what I want you to do is spend a little bit of time and, and say, okay, from the perspective of, of having a creator... Uh, that is an integral part in creating some of the diversity of life, right? And, and let's, let's assume that what Genesis 1 teaches about the creation events is actually accurate and is actually historical. I want you to pick up on a question that I said is a fun one to think about, and that is on what day did God create bacteria? Okay? And so go right into your discussion with those around you. I'll let you know when we need to... Uh, have this together. All right. All right. So let me give you a little bit of background. Okay. I'll give you some uh, essential literary analysis background, and then I'll give you a, a, a story that will help to shape maybe how you think through this. Um, so first of all, an, an important way an, or an important tool you have in, um, in interpretation is to see how the original audience read right that piece of literature and so when you when you go and see how the early jews understood genesis 1 um there there are certain things that you need to realize one uh is that they they understood it to be literal 24-hour days right and so when you go and you see how early jews understood genesis 1 they understood it as literal 24-hour days however they also understood that in the beginning verses where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that phrase in the beginning throughout the Old Testament uh, is, is basically a statement that says all the way up to this point, okay? 
And so it's an interesting statement, and it's a way that, like, if you were going to actually tell the story of your life, you would say in the beginning and then talk about everything that's happened in your life up to that point. And so it's a word that doesn't, it's a phrase that doesn't necessarily give any context of time, okay? And so the, the, the Jews basically always understood it to be literal 24-hour days, but they also understood that in the beginning to basically make no specific mention of how much time, okay? And so what's, what's interesting from that is you get an interpretation that says once the creation events start that are actually described day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and day six, that what you're getting at are literal 24-hour days, okay? And it was understood to be at least, uh, at least a, a good deal historical, right? And you can make the argument that the original audience was a pre-scientific people, and so you could not necessarily tell them a story of creation that was trying to be incredibly scientific because they were ill-equipped to handle it, right? So I want you to understand that. Genesis 1 nece isn't necessarily a science textbook, but it has been interpreted by its earliest audience to be historical and to be representing literal 24-hour days, okay? So allow that to kind of help you as, as, as you think through this. So that's a little bit about the literary analysis background. A little bit about the, uh, just a story. So the overwhelming majority of evangelical scientists uh, hold to some kind of an intermediate view with regards to origins. And I would tell you one very popular view within that is that Genesis 1 is historical, but it is not meant to convey any actual um, description, really, of what actually happened. It is historical in that God created in that way, but it wasn't actually meant to convey any actual details. And so it's historical but it, it's, it's fairly allegorical. And, and its main purpose is, is describing um, that there is order by which the creation was created, okay? Uh, and what's interesting is you actually do get a literary transition between Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 1, God is very transcendent, other than when it talks about his spirit hovering over the deeps. And other than when you get into a glimpse of, of God saying, let us make man in our image, everything else, God is remote. He is apart from his creation, speaking creation into existence, right? Genesis 1, God is obviously very transcendent, separate from his creation, speaking it into existence. In Genesis 2, God is imminent, right? God is getting his hands dirty, making man, right? It zooms back in on the sixth day and talks about God creating man, and then from man creating woman, and so you get a very interesting literary transition that actually is used to support that idea, that Genesis 1 is historical, but fairly allegorical. And then when you get to Genesis 2, you get something that's not only historical, but actually is meant to convey the actual details. And then so the, I will tell you that is, that is a very common way of taking a middle ground. And so what you get from that is basically this kind of a view on origins, and I'll come back to your question, is that one, God created life from non-life. Two, God created some of the diversity of life. And three, man is a unique creation. Man does not share physical ancestry with any other portion of creation, okay? And so you, you oftentimes get a, a view of origins somewhere like that. Okay? And that is a, an extremely common position on origins at most Christian institutions in the United States and in Canada. Okay? Um, I will tell you that is not the doctrinal position that Masters takes. Uh, and, and, and Masters takes a, a position uh, that holds that Genesis 1 is historical and actually conveying details. And if that's the case, which, you know, we can have these kinds of discussions, I think is a good way to actually approach it. Then you have to start thinking through, okay, well, what is actually happening on these events? Because it, Genesis is not a science textbook, meaning we have to think through some of these details because they aren't provided. Revealing those details to a group of people that don't even know what bacteria is would not be helpful, right? Yeah. So I'm still, I mean, I understand the intent, but I'm not, I don't understand, isn't, 
a historical narrative conveying details? Um, well, that? so you've got like Exodus 16, right? Where you have a song um, basically being sung about what God did in bringing the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And it is historical, but it's not actually conveying the, the, the exact order of details that actually happened, right? And, and when you look at Genesis 1, not only is God very transcendent, and then you get a transition in, in, in your image of God as you move to Genesis 2, but Genesis 1 actually has the structure of Hebrew poetry. It's got Hebrew poetry has a very specific structure, and parts of Genesis 1 actually have that structure, Meaning it seems to be that there's some poetry to it, which then would beg, should we then think through it like we do Exodus 16, where you've got a historical event talking about God bringing the nation of Israel out of Egypt, but not necessarily conveying all of the historical details that the other chapters of Exodus provide. Because it's a song being sung about what God did, and it's not necessarily a his history lesson. Right? It's like something you would teach your children as a reminder. So then the question is, was Genesis 1 a, a story to remind the nation of Israel that God created and that there's order to the creation and that man is made in God's image, but it's not necessarily conveying all of the details in, in you know, a, a full and succinct way? Okay. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's interesting. And so then if you're going to, okay, so if you're going to hold that, you know, what Genesis 1 teaches is fully history, right? And actually is conveying meaningful information. Then you have to think about, okay, well, when were bacteria created? What do we think? What day? This is a fun one. So this is actually a discussion. I, I taught at Biola for a couple of years, and I won't tell you Biola's position on origins. You can go find that for yourself. They published their doctrinal statement. Uh, but I will tell you, there's a variety of ideas on the faculty there. Um, and I don't know if when I interviewed, they knew my position on, on origins. Um, and uh, so th there was a, 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 an argument that started that basically went along this way. Uh, it's absurd to be a young earth creationist because on what day would God have created bacteria, right? I mean, this is actually exactly what came up, this exact question. Mm -hmm. And we actually had a really fruitful discussion um, about it because I gave my position and uh, so anyways so let's go what what day yeah okay oh uh, you can yeah you don't have to yeah I mean you could just say third day and leave it at that or you can give us an explanation okay we'll say third day and leave it at that okay Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. So you, you, what we have now, there's a question about how much does our world now actually model the world before the fall, right? And some of that's not clear. But from the world we have now, I think the best explanation you can give is that bacteria were created on the third, fifth, and sixth day as part of those creations. That, and I think you can make an argument, it's kind of a fun argument to make, that you cannot be biologically human without the bacteria living in your body. Mm -hmm. yeah. That in order to be biologically human, those bacteria need to be present and in a somewhat correct proportion in order for you to be fully biologically human. Yeah. Right? And then so you can do that with other things as well. You could, you could make an argument that in order to be fully biologically, I don't know, anything, let's do an armadillo because they're fantastic, um, that you would need to have the correct gut bacteria that they have and in the somewhat correct proportion in order to be fully biologically an armadillo. And you're like, well, what about pathology when things don't work out? And I think if you've got an issue with your gut bacteria and because of that, you've got an obvious pathology, like some kind of an autoimmune disease or an inability to absorb nutrients correctly, I think you've, you're, you're just emphasizing that argument all the better, right? Your body isn't working correctly because you're not fully biologically human. And that's why your body's not working correctly. And that can be restored and we can work on that. But I think you can make that argument. In which case you can make the argument that in order for God to actually set, once he separates the waters by creating land, in order to actually have a world like that, you need bacteria. 
You need bacteria functioning to move nutrients through ecosystems. You need bacteria functioning to actually hold various structures together. And then once you start creating other living organisms, you absolutely need, need bacteria for them to function correctly. Yeah. Um, I have two thoughts. Um, uh -huh. One, I just kind of, like when it says the swarming and the creeping, like are they kind of Yeah, the creeping things. Yeah, I think a, a, a lot of that, and historically Hebrews have, th uh, Jews have thought of that as like reptiles and, you know, they've, they've interpreted the creeping things that creep as, like, reptiles and amphibians. Um, and the beasts of the field more of, like, mammals, you know. That's probably what you're getting as some kind of an early classification separating groups based on their characteristics. And then as far as, like, what you said about pathology and stuff, I kind of think that maybe that happened after the fall because it said that everything absolutely right right absolutely yeah I, I think what what you have when you start losing some of the viability uh is a is a result of a broken creation right yeah we'll continue this discussion for another time but we've got uh we've got to continue to move on through some of these questions i just wanted to give you some food for thought uh and to think about that because it's a fun thing to think about can you be human without your gut bacteria i think you can make a pretty compelling argument that that no you're not actually fully human um all right, so this actually brings in this next question really well. Uh, and that question is, how do antibiotics contribute to the problem of bacterial infections? So first, a little background. Literally thousands of human diseases are caused by bacteria. They are not the only pathogens, but they, um, they are associated with literally thousands of human diseases. Uh, some examples, these come out of the text, the Plague of Athens in 430 BC that killed about a quarter of the Athenian army, uh, we believe was caused by Salmonella inter enterica, uh, the causative agent of typhoid fever. Uh, and they, they think that because they actually found some of uh, fossilized remains of Salmonella enterica in some of those soldiers. So, uh, bubonic plague that killed nearly half of Europe on two separate occasions, uh, was, we believe, was caused by Yersinia pestis. And that is because this is still active. People still get bubonic plague and have all of the symptoms described uh, as people described what was going on in Europe. Uh, and it's caused by Yersinia pestis now, another bacteria. So we've got a lot of emerging diseases. Emerging diseases refers to anything that's novel, new, that's showing up for the first time or being described for the first time. Probably not actually showing up for the first time, but being described for the first time. And a lot of these, 60%, maybe 70%, maybe even more, are what are called zoonoses. That root zoo means animal. And so these are diseases that come from animals. So a lot of the emerging human diseases are normal animal components that don't cause a lot of disease in animals, and then when they spread to humans, uh, they do. And so then let's talk about the antibiotic use. I'll, I'll get you in just a second, Charles. Um, so uh, almost all of the antibiotic use in our country uh, comes from the agricultural industry. Um, I mean, just, just a, a huge percentage of all of the antibiotics uh, administered are actually administered to cattle or pigs or chickens or some other uh, animal in the agricultural industry. Although we do oftentimes use them unnecessarily in human infections, either in, an, in a bacterial infection that we can fight in other ways or as treatment for viral infections to which an antibiotic has no use. Uh, but both of those actually help to generate and develop antibiotic resistant bacteria, uh, especially the way we administer it in the agricultural industry, which is in really low levels. And so it doesn't tend to completely wipe out the non-resistant forms. It just makes it to where the resistant forms are become more abundant. And then so we have even really minor, really weak uh, bacterial species, but are antibiotic resistant. And so they can get it they can actually proliferate and, and get into huge numbers. So probably the most important medically or the most medically relevant of these um, bacterial resistant bacteria are both the same species, Staphylococcus aureus or Staph aureus. Uh, and then you have methicillin resistant Staph aureus, which this is MRSA, M-R-S-A, and then vancomycin resistant, or sometimes you'll see vancomycin immune 
staff or is just so that they can make the acronym VISA instead of VRSA. Uh, but regardless, you've got a bacterium that is resistant uh, to a widely used um, antibiotic. And so many um, microbiologists actually argue that we are right now poised for a global pandemic from a relatively um, easy to treat bacteria just because of the presence and the abundance of uh, antibiotic resistant forms of these bacteria and because of our reliance on using those as our only means of treating. And this is where we get into our question that we had for this week of how do bacteriophages impact humans? Bacteriophages, and I think there was some confusion I put in parentheses, think of plant viruses. And so many of you went to bacteriophages being plant viruses. What I was trying to get you to think there is that indirect relationship between the virus and us. As far as we know, bacteriophages do not infect humans directly. There are no known examples of that, but they definitely impact humans indirectly. One way is as a treatment for bacterial infections. And prior to the uh, success of antibiotics was actually one of the most fruitful areas of research in combating bacterial pathogens, was using bacteriophages, and is now probably very soon going to become the main way we fight bacteria rather than antibiotics is by using bacteriophages. Yeah, Charles. Um, first of all, AIDS, wasn't that a zoo, uh, zoonosis? Uh, AIDS, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, that's what we think. Yeah, okay. yeah. Could have... From oh. apes, not, not monkeys. Oh, but, apes, yeah. okay. Um, could... Is it possible, perhaps, for the origin of pathological diseases, maybe were originally all zoonosis diseases? Um, yeah, I think there are some human... It, it, there are some human pathogens that look like they have been human pathogens for all of human history. Um, and then, so then you have another question, so of what, what started the problem in the first place. But yeah, the idea is current estimates are anywhere from 60 to 90% of all known human diseases um, have either been shown to be zoonotic, that is they came from animals, or are believed to be zoonotic, that did not originate in humans. And I think it gives you a, a nice way of explaining uh, the presence of, of disease, at least in humans. And then is it possible for bacteria to eventually become resistant to bacteriophages like they do? To oh, the sure, virus? yeah. So what happens is, yeah, it's a good question. So phages and bacteria usually get to a point where they develop a, uh, a stable and healthy balance where the phages are growing at a rate that makes the phages happy, although can living things really be happy? I don't know. Can bacteria be happy even though they're living organisms? I don't know. Um, uh, but they usually, they usually get to like an equilibrium where the viruses is replicating at a rate that doesn't destroy all of the bacterial individuals but keeps them in check. The problem with disease is usually not the presence of the bacteria but the amount of bacteria that's there. So even if they were resistant to the phages, they wouldn't be resistant in the same way that they would to antibiotics, which basically gets it to where 99 plus percent of all the bacteria in that population are antibiotic resistant and are basically completely immune to that antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a, an equilibrium, even if some of the bacteria aren't being killed by the viruses, enough of them are that they're in a healthy balance, that their population is in check. Mm -hmm and our immune system can hold them in check, and you're not going to experience the disease in the same way. At least that's the idea. Yeah, because yeah, the, 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 the means by which you control the population is completely different. Antibiotics, um, the way we use antibiotics is not normal. So there's no like normal equilibrium that you can establish that's good. There is an equilibrium that you can establish, but it's not a healthy balance. Um, yeah. It seems like it's more like a, a fancy band -aid. Oh, it's, yeah, it certainly is. Yeah, it certainly is. And it is a very fancy Band-Aid. Yeah, and so here's a, an image of Salmonella uh, enterica, the causative agent of typhoid, again, believed to be responsible for the death of the Athenian soldiers about 430 B.C. Uh, here are some images of the plague. Uh, this is just focusing on the Great Plague in London, killing uh, uh, about 20% uh, about of the city's population. Here's looking at Yersinia pestis, 
uh, gram negative rod shaped bacterium and you see you're like man this looks a little coaxy a little spherical and that's where I told you that there's kind of some some that are difficult here's some of the pathology again you usually have about 20 cases a year in the US of bubonic plague and it's called bubonic plague because of the swelling of your lymph nodes that are called buboes and so your lymph nodes swell up and you get these uh, these these buboes as part of it as opposed to there are other forms of the plague that are not called bubonic plague yeah Yeah, and so it's a matter of, of how, um, how viruses work compared to bacteria. Um, and so viruses, um, the reason why smallpox, well, are, I mean, and there still are smallpox outbreaks in, in places in the world. It is eradicated from most of the Western world. Uh, but most people argue that if you actually had a, a, an active form of, of the virus, you could trigger uh, a, uh, a, an explosion. Um, but yeah, so there are some differences in the, in the mechanics uh, of how that works. So this, um, this February, uh, we, do, we do our creation summit every February. This February, we have a guy named John Sanford coming, and he's a geneticist. And um, he has written a lot about what's called genetic entropy. And uh, which is basically accumulating randomness and disorder in the genome every time an organism replicates. So every time an organism replicates, you, you build up kind of mutations, errors in, in the code, and, and the effects of those are uh, cumulative. So you have kind of an exponential growth or an exponential decline in the function of organisms. And so viruses replicate a lot more rapidly than bacteria do, and therefore they should, at least certain strains of viruses should go extinct a lot more rapidly uh, than bacteria do. And so here uh, is an illustration of emerging and re-emerging diseases. So emerging, again, this is a disease being described for the first time. Re-emerging are when it's been combated, knocked down, and it just uh, keeps reappearing. Uh, here you have Lyme disease uh, caused by another bacterium. This is Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, is a causative agent of Lyme disease, and some of the pathology associated with this. I, I, again, I just wanted to show you some examples uh, from the text. Uh, here is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Really looks exactly the same as non-methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. The difference is 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 you cannot uh, you cannot kill it. Um, with normal antibiotic use, well, at least with methicillin. And so basically to address that question of how has the use of antibiotics contributed to bacterial infections, what it's done is it's basically led to the uh, resistant individuals, which were always present. Uh, resistant individuals were always present, but they tend to be a weaker form of the pathogen now being the overwhelming majority of the individuals in the population because uh, the resistant or the non-resistant individuals are being killed by the bacteria. And what's interesting is as soon as you stop, or the antibacteria, as soon as you remove the, the antibacterial agent, the antibiotic, it, it goes back to being that the non-resistant individuals make up most of the population. Um, and so, but what you have is the resistant individuals being the overwhelming majority of the, all of the forms in the population, and basically us not having a good way of combating them. And so even though they're a weaker form of the bacterium, we basically have no way to combat them, and they can grow and, and, and get huge numbers uh, inside of the host and just overwhelm the system. Yeah. Are antibiotics uh, bacteria-specific or no? Um, not usually. No. Yeah, that's a good question. There are some that, and that's, that's that you have to realize that uh, <coughs> developing treatments is really expensive. And so if you're going to do that, there has to be some kind of an incentive. And making a bacteria-specific antibiotic is tough because then you're only going to be able to get money from treating that bacterial infection. 
So it's actually more beneficial to do a more general antibiotic that maybe targets a, an entire class mm -hmm. rather than a specific bacterium. Yeah. Whereas the bacteriophages are going to be bacteria specific. Yeah. They're far more of a specific treatment, which again is a cost associated with that. Yeah, like now you're trying to get investment of money in a treatment that its use is going to be restricted compared to antibiotic use. All right, so why isn't washing food with water enough to prevent infections? You have this discussed a lot with, um, with uh, fruits and vegetables. So you have to remember that bacteria often make biofilms, right? We talked about these microbial mats, stromatolites, either of those you could have used as an example for a biofilm. But bacteria make biofilm, and when they do, they secrete sugars that basically glue them together. And uh, they hold the bacteria together onto uh, that material. And so the reason why washing food with water isn't enough is because oftentimes it doesn't wash away the bacteria that are anchored onto that with a biofilm. Okay? And then you have to think there are several diseases where the biofilm itself contributes to the pathology. And what we mean by that is that there are chemicals in that extracellular matrix that are triggering the pathology. So some examples of this, cystic fibrosis. This isn't chemicals, but this is the biofilm basically keeping it to where you've got this really thick mucus in the lungs, and it makes water moving water really, really difficult, and exchanging gas is really, really difficult, and so it makes breathing really, really difficult. Legionnaire's disease, otitis media, uh, dental plaques, right? All of these in which you can see um, the, the, the biofilm itself contributing to the pathology. And so biofilms, all, I mean, they just make bacteria extremely difficult to remove. Now, if you cook it, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if the, if the biofilm is still there, because if you cook it, you kill all the individuals and even, you know, cause some proteins in the group uh, to unfold. Um, but, yeah, I mean, biofilms just make it really difficult uh, to wash some of these. And then, so that's why there are certain fruits and vegetables that you want to wash not just with water but with soap and water because uh, soap can help to dislodge uh, some of that material that's, that's stuck on there. Yeah. So, like, I, I was – Kind of came out. Is there a situation where, like, you have like a an extremophile, like bacteria on food that you cook and it still survived? Right. Still infect you? Like, does cooking really kill everything? Or oh, it doesn't kill everything. You know, I mean, there are some things that can survive temperatures much higher than what we typically cook our food at, but those are rare, and they tend to not be pathogenic. Extremophiles tend to like to just you know live life on their own. Okay. Um, they don't they don't really have the capabilities of infected things. Good question. <clears throat> All right. Well, we are out of time. It is Friday, so have a wonderful weekend. Be safe. Make good decisions. Thank you. You're welcome.